Okay, hi everybody. Um, my name is Jeff Cody. I'm a uh, software engineer with Red Hat, and I'm here to talk to you about QMU code routines today. Um, so we'll get into code routines, uh, what they are, um, how uh, how QMU uses code routines as well. Um, so we'll go over a little bit of just a general concept of code routines and how they differ from something like threads and uh, Then we'll talk about how QMU implements coroutines and how QMU um, does all the context switching. Um, we'll, we'll cover one of the ways in which QMU does it. There's multiple implementations of it, but we'll focus on one for this talk. Um, the other ones are conceptually very similar to that. And then we'll discuss some of the problems or maybe the perceived problems of coroutines. Um, not that they're perfect, but they work pretty well for our uh, requirements, um, and perhaps there's some alternatives. Um, so any any alternatives are obviously uh, welcome. So if we start at the very high level view here, and we discuss what are coroutines. Well, coroutines are a way for QMU or any other user space application to do multitasking. Uh, but to do this multitasking uh, cooperatively rather than uh, in a preemptive manner. So if we look at uh, comparing that against threads, which obviously allows us to do a similar thing, um, threads, however, are managed typically by the OS. So your OS, you have a, you know, the kernel has a schedule that will run and schedule your thread and make sure that your thread gets adequate time and we'll preempt uh, other running threads. So this requires a bit more sophisticated locking um, when you have something that has preemption going on that's going to be interrupting other workers. And particularly if you're spawning a lot of I.O. heavy threads that are constantly accessing common resources. So then we look at, uh, contrast that against coroutines. Um, these are completely user space managed. Um, there's, there's nothing uh, that's scheduling coroutines. Uh, there's no coroutine manager running behind the scenes that makes sure that your coroutine runs. Um, it's really just a function call uh, with a linear execution uh, that has a bunch of uh, go-tos that jump around um, to enable multitasking for that thread of operation. Um, and so by its very nature, being in user space and jumping around with uh, non-local go-tos, it is cooperative. So you have to play nice. Um, if you don't um, do anything with your coroutine to yield your time, uh, all you really are is a function call, which is really the point and the whole idea of the coroutines. Um, so that's really a design feature, not a, not a flaw. And of course, with the coroutines, since we have uh, uh, a relatively small amount of uh, stuff we need to save for a context switch, uh, since we're jumping around on a, in a, on a stack space, it's got it's lower transactional overhead. It's less, less friction for our multitasking. So what does QMU use? Well, I'm sure everyone here knows QMU is a hybrid architecture. Uh, we use both threads and coroutines, right? So we have worker threads and threads for other tasks that run. But we use coroutines a lot in the block layer. Um, we don't want to spawn lots of uh, threads for every task we do for a coroutine. So we will use coroutines within I.O. threads um, to perform our multitasking without blocking. So if we look a little bit at the history of QMU and why QMU uses coroutines um, instead of some other uh, architecture. Um, QMU has an event loop where we respond to events. And in the past, uh, for tasks that we would use coroutines for now, uh, we would have to have uh, callback functions. Um, and obviously, with a bunch of callback functions, it's a lot more cumbersome. And it can be difficult to debug um, and difficult to follow what's going on. 
uh, when everything is completely asynchronous like that. Um, the coroutines offer a little bit more linear function flow. I mean, you have a, a function that you are entering just like any other function. And uh, so you can logically follow the flow of your code execution. So where does QMU use coroutines? Well, right now it's mainly in the block layer. Um, there's nothing in about coroutines specifically that would prohibit it from being used somewhere else, but it's not really used anywhere else. But it's a, it's a general concept, uh, not something that is tied exclusively to the block layer. Um, all the block I.O. functions are more or less coroutines. So, you, you know, you're doing a read or a write or a flush. Um, those get implemented as coroutines. Um, that switchover happened uh, a few years ago. Um, we also have some QMP commands that are implemented as coroutines. And so these are some long-running tasks that happen over QMP. So you have something like libvirt that will request, or a user that will request an operation like a block job, like a block commit, or a mirror, or, or any of the other um, block jobs. Those, um, since they take a long time to run, even by block I.O. standards, uh, are implemented as a coroutine that can be even paused by uh, um, QMP command as well um, and resumed. All right, so if we looked in a little bit closer here um, at our actual coroutine, and let's look at the states of a coroutine that we have um, as we use them here in QMU. So when we start off with a coroutine, um, the first thing we're going to do, obviously, is we're going to create that coroutine. So when we create a coroutine, the coroutine now exists in a pause state. And immediately after this creation, the first time you create a coroutine, um, we set up the, the, the stack buffers and our context buffers. Um, and then we immediately jump back out of that coroutine to the caller of the coroutine create function. So we're, we're paused right above the function call. As I said before, a coroutine is a function call. Um, so when we're paused right above that function call, you can kind of think of it as you're dangling right above that function call. So the next time we resume, we're going to enter into that function call. And this is only applicable at the very first time you do your coroutine creation. So once we're in the pause state, um, if we resume, um, that is done with the QMU coroutine enter command, um, we're now in the running state. Uh, so the running state is just like a function call. So you're executing through, you're doing whatever I.O. you need to do, like any other function call. And from this point, you have two options of what this function is going to do. One is you can, do, you can just exit. Um, that's not as interesting. If you just create the coroutine and then enter it and execute your code, your code runs just like any other function call um, with just a little more obtuse method of starting it. But uh, it, it's just a function call that runs and then exits. So a little more interesting is if we have our coroutine and we actually do something like a yield. Um, and a yield is how we pause the coroutine. So once you uh, perform a yield inside your coroutine, uh, we will then return uh, control back to whoever entered that coroutine. So I'll walk through the coroutine structure here uh, just a little bit because it's, it's useful to think of what a coroutine actually is. Um, since it's not um, a thread that's really running, it's just a function call, we do have a little bit of structure around that coroutine. And so this is the coroutine uh, structure. The entry pointer is just your function pointer that gets called when a coroutine is, uh, goes into the enter state. And then you have your function argument, which is uh, an opaque pointer. You know, you see in the block uh, block layer, uh, we have function calls with an opaque pointer. It's a similar concept. It's just uh, a void pointer. It can be whatever data that is appropriate for your your coroutine. Um, and the next thing we have, and this is very important, is the caller. Um, so if you're just a normal function running in QMU and you create a coroutine. Um, and you go and you call the QMU coroutine enter, so you actually start executing the coroutine. 
uh, a reference gets made for you that you never see, um, that references you, even though you're not a coroutine, as a coroutine. So conceptually, um, everything's a pseudo coroutine. Um, however, uh, you don't have all the other things like a stack space set up so that you can't, you can't, for instance, yield something that was never created as a coroutine to begin with. However, um, this is how uh, re control is returned back to uh, whoever enters the coroutine. We also have coroutine pools, um, which all the coroutine pool is, it's a, it's a global free list of coroutines. So when we create coroutines, um, if, you're use, if, the global, if the free list pool is enabled, we are not uh, deallocating and destroying that coroutine at the exit. We're just returning it to the coroutine free list pool. This way, you reduce a little bit of the uh, overhead of allocating all the coroutine uh, <coughs> stuff and memory. Uh, we also, each coroutine has a uh, queue of other coroutines that may be executed if they are in the wake-up queue. So uh, if there's coroutines in the wake-up queue, um, when we go and do a yield or a terminate on a coroutine, uh, for the associated coroutine, it'll go through all the next coroutines in the wake-up queue and enter into each one of those before you finally return control back to the original uh, caller of the, the coroutine enter function. So if we look a little bit at some of the APIs, I broke these out into a couple sections here. Uh, this is the core API functions. We have a way to create coroutines, to enter the coroutines, as I mentioned, uh, yield the coroutine. Then another one I didn't talk about, and that's sleep. And all sleep really is, it's a, it's a way to yield with a timer to then call the coroutine enter function. So in the create, um, we create a new coroutine and then we pause before the function call as we talked about. And you can see there's the, the uh, prototype for the function uh, pulled from the header file there. These are all available in uh, the uh, QMU include directory or the include QMU directory. Um, and for our enter, the enter uh, resumes whatever the last pause point is, which is going to be where you did a uh, yield. The last time you did a, a, a QMU code screen yield, whether it was called directly or through a helper function or a macro or whatever, that's going to be your pause point. Um, and once you, ye yeah, okay. Uh, so once we call a QMU enter, so it's, important to keep in mind that control will not return back to your function until that coroutine pauses. Um, so if you want to, in, if you're calling a, a QMU coroutine, you need to make sure that you have a method not only to pause it, but then to resume it as well. Because once you call the coroutine yield, um, there's no automatic rescheduling of your coroutine. It's done running until you do something with it. So, uh, you can have a coroutine, you can do a yield, and if no one ever does anything to resume that coroutine, it's just going to sit there and it's going to have done nothing. And that's where the, the coroutine sleep uh, is useful. It, it does a yield, and then it schedules a uh, timer in the AO context bottom half to wake up that coroutine by calling QMU coroutine enter again. And this is used, um, one place this is used is in some of the block job loops where we have a, a loop, for instance, in commit or mirror where we're going through and doing iteration of copying data and then we'll sleep for a certain duration of time uh, in each iteration to allow other uh, coroutines and domain control to, to execute. So let's look a little bit at some coroutine queues. Um, the coroutine queues are a simple queue just of coroutines to be run. Uh, you can create this coroutine queue and you can do some things where you, uh, if you have multiple tasks that are related, um, like um, the block driver flush where you want to queue up multiple flushes but you want to make sure that they all um, uh, get done at the same time or they all, the control flows all the way through to the last one. You can have the queue entries that 
um, you can schedule them to wake up. And awoken entries will run after a yield or a terminate. So when we, when you do a QMU coroutine yield, that control goes back to the, the QMU coroutine enter function where we initially did our switch. And uh, then we'll go through that queue in each coroutine that's been moved to the uh, uh, awake queue will then be uh, run. I'll go through these real quick. I won't spend a lot of time on the uh, coroutine queue API functions. Um, and we have an init function, nothing real exciting about that. Um, we also have a, uh, a wait function. So in the QMU queue wait function, um, what that do is, what that will do is add um, the caller queue routine to the um, coroutine queue and oh, next time uh, that is moved into the await queue, it'll be executed. I should take a moment here to point out, um, if you see this here, the coroutine function, that doesn't actually do anything, it's just a, uh, uh, some syntactic sugar, but it, it's used to indicate um, where uh, these functions are expecting to be run in a coroutine context. So if you call a function expect, that expects to be run in a coroutine context and you're not a coroutine or in a coroutine context, um, then you'll most likely get uh, an abort um, because uh, you don't have all the associated um, memory stack created for yourself. And co we also have queue next where we can uh, move that coroutine that's on the queue to the wake up queue, which will allow it to then be run after the, uh, the yield. And restart all will restart all the coroutines in your queue. Um, well, we'll move them all to the wake field, which will then run uh, sequentially in the, in, the, in the next. Then you also have a way to directly enter your coroutine in the next coroutine in queue if you want, and then a way to query if your coroutine queue is empty or not. So now we also have coroutine mutexes, which, um, you know, we, we're doing cooperative multitasking, so it may seem like we don't need to worry about any sort of access control or anything like that, but we do. Um, it just, it's a little bit easier to manage. Uh, so given how we use coroutines, especially in a block layer, in an image format driver or anywhere else really, if we're going through and writing data to a file like an image file header or an image file contents or anything like that, um, since we're doing long running I.O., obviously we're running a coroutine for a reason. So we're going to pause and yield. Um, and at that point, other uh, I.O.s or other coroutine may go in and expect to be able to go in and access that same section. Uh, so we need a way to protect that section and that's what the coroutine mutex does. Um, we can obtain a lock um, and if we fail to obtain a lock, um, it'll put the column coroutine at the end of the queue. Um, and then it'll yield and wait until that lock is available. Uh, similarly, uh, the mutex unlock will release the lock um, and then it'll wake up the next coroutine on the queue, which will likely be one of those. We also have some uh, read locks for uh, the queues. Um, so we have a, a read lock that will wait for no writers to be writing to the, the lock section. And again, while it's waiting, it'll go on the end of a queue. We also have a write lock uh, that waits until there are no writers or readers. Um, and again, we'll put it in the queue while waiting. And of course, the unlock to release those locks will wake up all the readers um, or if there's a writer waiting, it'll wake up one writer at a time. All right, so if we look a little bit closer at how the coroutines are implemented in QEMU, Q um, we actually have four implementations. We have uContext, um, which is the default. Um, 
The problem with it is it's not available as many as many platforms. But it's the preferred method. It's pretty straightforward. Um, there's also SIG alt stack, which is a little bit newer. And it should be available on all POSIX platforms, I believe. Um, I'm not going to go into SIG alt stack as much here. Um, but there's a paper that uh, introduces the concept of using uh, a signal stack for uh, coroutines. Um, and that's the paper there. I, I pulled a reference to that paper out of the GNU portable threads library, um, PTH, which is, uh, I believe, where this implementation signal stack was uh, derived from. Uh, and it's not the default yet in QMU. I'm actually not sure um, all the reasons why yet. My guess is most likely it's just got less time being beat on it to be confident of it. Um, running some of the uh, perf tests, um, it seems to run more or less equal to uh, U-context as far as uh, time, which makes sense if you look at the underlying implementations. Um, they are very similar between U-context and SIG alt stack. The main difference is just how the initial context is created. But when we do our coroutine uh, switching um, and the yields and the enters, um, that code is very similar between U-context and SIG alt stack. And that's going to be where the bulk of your, your time is going to be spent in, when you're running. So some of the less common implementations that we have, uh, we have a, a Win32 implementation for Windows. It uses Windows fibers. Um, and obviously, it's, it's Windows only. And there's also a G-Threads implementation. Um, you know, if we go back and look at the initial discussion between uh, using coroutines versus using threads, you know, one idea could be, well, why don't we use threads instead of coroutines? Um, and G threads is a way of using threads as coroutines and masking the fact that you're using threads. So it does all the, the thread um, specific uh, uh, locking and management behind the scenes in a coroutine. Unfortunately, it's really slow. I don't know if it's just our implementation, if it could be cleaned up or not. Um, but it also has some bugs in it because it's not really used and it's not really functional. Um, so it's still there for debug only, but I'm not sure if anyone's actually ever using it. So it would. I use it. You use it? Okay. What for? Get my, get my stack traces in GDB. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we'll get into that a little bit here as well. So you're talking about when you get, you see the trampoline at your stack and, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, it can be used for, for debug. So I guess we shouldn't get rid of it for, for Dan. <laughs> All right, so if we look a little bit um, at the U context, um, this is where we get into the trampoline stuff that makes it a little bit more difficult to debug. Um, but we use the get context and make context and allocate and initialize our uh, initial stack that we're going to be switching to and from when we're doing the, uh, the, the jumping around with the non-local go-tos. And then we go and jump on the trampoline. So when you call the uh, create function, QMU coroutine create, um, after we set up our stack, um, we're going to go and do a uh, uh, swap context to do the jump to the beginning of the, the function. And then uh, our jump up will be saved uh, right before the coroutine function call. And then we'll jump back to the caller of QMU coroutine create. So the QMU coroutine create will return uh, shortly after creating the coroutine. Um, with a coroutine pointer that has um, the jump buff saved, so it'll start executing right above the, oh, right where you go into the coroutine function call. And so then the next uh, sig long jump in uh, the coroutine uh, switch will go to the save jump buff of that coroutine in a coroutine structure, and it'll start to function or resume the function. So I don't know if that's actually readable. I, that might be more <coughs> readable there. So if we look here at, um, oh, 
yeah, it's... We can look at the, the coroutine creation where um, we, we set up our, our current um, stack that gets allocated. Um, we, we get our, our current context. And then we use make context to um, uh, set um, the function to enter as coroutine trampling. Uh, and then we pass it the, um, uh, the old jump up that we, we put in the uh, entry argument here. Um, and we're using the entry argument that will be used later at the enter, but no one's using it yet, so we can use it for the environment. Um, and then sig set jump here saves the old environment and swap context will now make the, the jump here to the trampoline function um, and return the old context here. So if we look up at, at that, this is the trampoline function. So when we go in initially on a create into the coroutine trampoline, um, we have uh, our um, where we, we save the, the jump buff here. Um, and then right here is where we'll jump back. We bounce back out of the trampoline um, to the end of the coroutine new function. So effectively what happens is we, this jumps back to the return and we end up back at whoever called QMU coroutine create. Um, so the next time that you call QMU coroutine enter, this we're, we're right here. And so control falls down through here where we call the actual QMU coroutine function. Um, and then once, and as you see here, the chemo coroutine function here is just going to run until it exits. And then we'll do a switch uh, with indicating that the coroutine terminated so it can be cleaned up uh, later. Um, so if you never do a yield, it's just going to execute and then fall through and then clean itself up. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some uh, problems we might have with coroutines. All right, so this is probably uh, what Dan was talking about here, um, where, hmm, that's actually not what I wanted to show. Anyways, <laughs> I'll, I'll bring it up here um, in, a, in a demo here quickly, but the, uh, the, the issue is it can make, there we go, that's what I wanted to show. It can make debugging painful at times. Um, so when we enter the, the trampoline, uh, when you're debugging with GDB, you'll, you'll stop, maybe you have a breakpoint that's set or whatever, um, and you do a backtrace and you go down and all you see is uh, the trampoline there and you don't know the context from where you came and it can be a little bit frustrating, right? Um, but there are some uh, GDB helper functions that QMU has in a scripts directory to do a little bit of probing to figure some of that out that, that can be useful. Um, matter of fact, I'll go ahead and, and do a, see if this works, uh, a quick, quick demo here. So I have right here where we have uh, um, a breakpoint set on QCAL2, uh, the coroutine read inside QCAL2 driver. Um, I, I haven't run QMU yet, so once I hit run, we'll, we'll hit that right away, but we'll be in a, in a coroutine context. Hmm. All right, so, yeah, this is a little more difficult to type this way. <laughs> so um, we can see here that um, if I do a backtrace, uh, Unfortunately, it falls off on the screen a little bit down there at the bottom. Um, maybe I can move the screen up a little bit. Or maybe not, oh, there we go. Okay. All right, let's see if that works a little bit better. So as we can see with our backtrace there, um, 
We, we get down, we get to the trampoline, and it's, it's, it's not very informative to the source of the, the read call. But since we know we're in the coroutine context, because of the, the fact that we see the trampoline there, there's a, a coroutine variable called current that it points to the current coroutine. So if we, if we look at current, that's a coroutine pointer. And, and we'll just look inside that coroutine pointer. And uh, there should be a collar. Yeah, so we see the collar here. This is that pseudo coroutine pointer um, that I mentioned before that gets created when you enter into a coroutine. So if we source the GDB, QMU GDB uh, script, there's now um, a function we can use, or a helper here we can use to, to query that. Um, so if we um, look at current caller, then this should give us a backtrace of where we came from here. So now you can see you know, we have a, a normal backtrace of what called and entered this, this coroutine before we went and did a, did a switch. So that's that. All right, yes, yeah, so we just covered that, that there. So um, other issues with the coroutines is, as you saw, there were four different implementations underlying the coroutine um, uh, itself. And that's a little bit of an issue because uh, while the coroutine code isn't a lot of code as far as lines of code, um, it's conceptually um, a little messy, and so there's a lot of potential for bugs to be latent or lurking in there. And it's also difficult to make sure that you support all the platforms that QMU should run on, um, because you might not know whether or not a coroutine is broken in some odd way. Um, and the coroutine implementation is a little bit complex, um, so you're basically trading off some complexity here. The coroutines themselves make it easier to write your code um, at the expense of being a little bit uglier underneath the covers than maybe if you used uh, uh, normal threads that are, are a little bit more standard. Um, but that's probably okay because uh, um, there's more development going on at that layer than there's going to be going on at the, the coroutine layer. Um, Another concern is it can rely on some compiler or glibc specific behavior. And, and maybe this is fine, maybe it's not a, an issue, but it's something to be aware of. Um, one thing, and I didn't even realize this until I was preparing for this talk, looking through uh, some of the coroutine stuff, but if you look at the, uh, for instance, the, the open group uh, uh, page on sig long jump, which is how we do our coroutine uh, uh, switching, um, at the bottom, it calls out the effect of a call of a sig long jump where initialization of the jump up structure was not performed in the calling thread is undefined. Um, and initially, that seems like it's not a problem, but uh, uh, Stefan actually pointed out to me that uh, we do indeed do this in threads. Um, so we have... Uh, So if we, if we see here in the, in the 9P directory, we, we specifically have a, a, a macro that's run where we uh, sleep a thread so that we can then enter it in another thread. Um, now, I, I looked through all the glibc specific documentation on um, uContext and sig long jump, and I didn't see anything particularly referencing threads one way or another. So maybe it's fine, I don't know. I'm not saying it's necessarily a problem, just that it's an example of how there can be some things that might behave differently from one system to a next based off of some undefined behavior um, that's not called out one way or the other. So in the original concept of coroutines, it would be a way to do cooperative multitasking on a single thread rather than a cross thread. All right, 
I think that's it. <laughs> so, any questions? Yeah. Just you uh, said something which I was trying to understand. You said that you don't do original intent was that it was not to cross threads. That means within the thread you do coroutine, right? Uh, it generally, I mean, coroutines as a concept is generally done within a singular thread. But uh, as you see in the nine piece so, stuff, we d use a little orthogonal to threading itself where it's the idea is it's a function that the function itself will execute um, without regards to where it runs from. I'm just not sure how no, a, example, is. a use case I'll give you. If I have a live migration, I know that I cannot do it in five seconds, let's say, but I want to initiate something on a task and use another task which will wait for that to complete from, say, node one to node two the, for the migration. And when it reaches 90%, uh, then I want to really say that, okay, let's now uh, jump from this coroutine to, uh, from one task to another to initiate or complete that by committing the whole thing. Right. Well, I so, mean, you should, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so, so here is what I want to know. You said you can't cross the threads, then is it not a problem for us? Well, I, I don't know if it's a problem for us. I mean, we're obviously doing it now, so I'm going to assume it's not a problem. <laughs> but um, I, I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, you can still use coroutines within the thread to do the multitasking. I mean, that's the idea that you'll sleep so you can do other things as well, um, <coughs> even within a singular thread. But I, I don't know if it's a problem right now for us to go across threads. coordination between the threads is a problem. This is what I understand from this. Well, it's not so much a coordination from... Um, it's a preempting problem. Who yeah. preempts what? Well, um, The coroutine, is, you're not going to have that same coroutine running multiple times through different threads. So it, it's not so much a problem of that as it is a problem of if your, your SIG set jump and your SIG long jump saved everything you need for that. I mean, if you think of it as a go-to statement, right? So you, you do this go-to not just somewhere else in the thread but to another thread. Um, is your stack and are all your signal masks and everything okay or not? I don't know. So it's undefined. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Well, the spec is undefined. I don't know what the glibc implementation is. Speaking about debug behavior, I think that there is one more important thing. Uh, we should be able somehow to list all blocking coroutines uh, in the process because if they have some hang, uh, in conventional debugging, we can look to all threads uh, where they are stuck, but there is no uh, such way for coroutines. And, in a, in the, and on the top of this, uh, the similar thing for bottom halves. We should somehow list all bottom halves to understand where the completion of the coroutine is stuck. Okay, yeah, so um, if, if we're going to uh, release all the coroutines, um, are you talking from a, just from a debugging perspective? Yes, I'm okay. talking about debugging perspective. Okay. Uh, it's a pain for me to understand where we really hang. Yeah, and, and it, that is one of the downfalls of coroutines is that it, it does introduce some additional debugging pain like that. So. Yeah, there could be some things we could do to ease that. Burden. Yes, there is some magic that we should think about. Yeah. Okay, another question actually about carotene locking. Uh, I would like to re-raise all discussion uh, from a previous year. I think that we do need primitive uh, which will ensure that carotene lock is really locked to provide useful asserts to look where the locking is missed. This definitely should be added to the scope. Okay, yeah, I won't argue that. Anything else? All right, well, that's it. Um, 
And of course, one last thing, I'm sure you've all been bugged multiple times about this already, but um, I went ahead and put this at the end and I stole Alex's uh, QR code here. So um, if you want to complete the KVM forum uh, survey, that would be great. And it'll help the future of KVM forum here. All right, thank you.